Death Grip by Matt Samet, Chapter 11. The first thing to realize about acute benzo withdrawal is that it's not anxiety as you know it. If anxiety is a yippy little chihuahua in a handbag, then this is a Rottweiler mauling your face off for months. A clinician listening to you describe your symptoms might diagnose anxiety, but deep inside, in your subjective experience where it truly matters, you will feel a primal and monolithic terror that cannot, as with garden variety anxiety, be reasoned with. Your calming GABA light switch is busted or even frozen in the off position, and you will not experience reality as it was until your receptors renormalize. The merest trifle, a barking dog, a near fender bender, an angry word from a friend, an upsetting movie, will push you off the panic cliff. This much I learned by studying my own reactions to stress. If anger or fear entered my system, or if I overexerted myself physically, I'd have panic attacks and remain flooded with adrenaline for hours and sometimes days. The parasympathetic nervous system would not bring me back down reliably as it had in the past, and sometimes it would not bring me back down at all. I return alone on a four-hour non-stop flight home from Baltimore to Denver, raw around the edges, away from the hospital and my father's house. After a final two weeks as an outpatient at Hopkins, after countless panic attacks and night terrors at my father's, after the night he came to my bedroom and stroked my brow as he had when I was a child and woke up distressed, I needed to let him resume his life, and I needed to try to get on with my own. I swallow a neurotin before aborting, taking my seat and pretend to read a pop boiler novel. It's difficult, but I'm doing it, which is no small thing. Then the plane aborts its takeoff. The nose is up. The engines are firing, and then they suddenly cut to nil and the pilot is slamming on the brakes. He comes over the intercom to let us know that the tower mistakenly gave us clearance and that we need to wait ten minutes to try again. My heart hiccups. It slams. My hands shake. I sweat. I wait for the panic to pass, as it has in the past, but it doesn't. I will stay in this heightened, hyper-alert state for the next four hours, avoiding eye contact with other passengers, gripping my clothes paper back like it's the Holy Bible, my gaze flitting about the cabin like a moth in a bell jar. As we descend into Denver, dropping through white, arctic front storm clouds, the pilot comes on again to tell us that the runways are too icy to land. He eases the plane back up and we start circling, the ground invisible, the moist air turning pink with molecules of frozen sunset. The plane jostles in the mist, its engines firing intermittently to keep us at elevation while snowplows clear the runways. Ice starts to crust on the wings, plastering over the landing lights. This is how jetliners crash. I think I might puke. I would rather open an exit door and jump out than feel this fear for one more second. When we finally land, I feel no relief being back on the ground. I should, but I don't. Casey is waiting outside the airport. It's night. We drive home through lashing snows. The gentle prairie swells along Pina Boulevard, heading south from Denver International overhead, poised to break like massive waves. I cringe in my seat, trying to disappear into the upholstery. Casey talks about her infant nephew who's having seizures, and I can't stand to listen. This is too dark, too intense and scary, this poor, ailing baby boy. I become him, feeling that I might have a seizure myself my gut as empty and stale as a mummy's core. At Hopkins, they warned me that the transition back home would be hard, but this is something else entirely. This is sinister. That night, I do not sleep. I do not even approximate, approximate sleep. The adrenaline keeps me awake, firing and firing until morning, until a thin meniscus of orange forms in the east and pale dishwater light seeps over Boulder. I thought I would feel stronger back in Colorado, but I'm weaker than ever, a textbook agoraphobe. I rarely leave the house. I pace and fret and writhe and sweat as the walls close in. I have nothing to do, but neither am I able to do anything because I'm so distracted and distractible. I was supposed to go to Hawaii with my father, his girlfriend, and her children for my dad's 16th birthday, 60th birthday, but I demur. My father and I get into a shouting match on the phone. He wants me there and keeps saying, You have to come. You have to. Partially for selfish reasons, but also, I'm sure, because he wants the hospital to have fixed me. Casey heads home to Oregon, and I'm alone over Christmas. I drive her a half mile to the bus depot from where she'll leave for the airport. Tiny Boulder seems immense. Downtown, with its 50-foot buildings, 
looks towering and frenetic as if I've been picked up by a tornado in Nebraska and deposited in Times Square, but also distant, like the surface of a glacier glimpsed through a telescope. I begin to taper the lithium and neurotin. I don't care what might happen. One of these meds has brought a rash over my belly, and they need to go. I have a med check-in with Dr. Porridge. He urges me not to quit the pills, but I tell him that I'm doing it anyway. He reiterates that I have anxiety and depression, which must be medicated, and that I'm undoing all the quote-unquote great treatment I received at Hopkins. Fine, whatever. During those first two weeks back home, I'll email my friend Jem. I'm in complete and utter hell. The withdrawal and panic attacks are awful, and the fucking shithead docs at Hopkins and my doctor here are trying to tell me it's my natural anxiety. I feel pretty overwhelmed and can't leave the house much. It's a La Nina year, so great fronts back up among the con along the continental divide, sending Chinook winds howling over Mount Sanitas, flexing the windows, tearing the screen doors from their hinges. I fear that our duplex might, like me, blow away into the darkness, streaming off atom by atom. Clyde has figured out a way to escape under the backyard fence and launches rogue missions down the alley, upsetting trash cans to scrounge for food scraps. He's quick. If I don't stand watch atop the stairs, if I turn away for so much as ten seconds, he's gone, and I must spend an hour, maybe two, hunting him out in frigid winds under the sterile moonlight, beneath dead leaves rattling on threadbare trees reaching skeleton hands skyward. I can hardly breathe amidst a thick, molasses-like fatigue, lurching like some creep along the alleys, calling for the hound in a high, reedy wheeze. If Clyde heads uphill toward 4th and 3rd streets, it takes even longer to find him because then I can only shuffle, pausing every few steps for a breath like a Himalayan mountaineer in the death zone. I'm always out looking for Clyde. He thinks it's the greatest game. Mornings are bad because I wake up spitting blood, my throat and sinuses inflamed from chronic hyperventilation. I hack up the corrupt red blossoms, spit them into the toilet, and flush them away, wiping bloody sputum from my lips. This will go on for a year. I will start to sleep with nasal strips on and duct tape over my mouth in the hopes of promoting slow, diaphragmatic breathing. Daytime is bad because I have nothing to do. I'm constantly in a state of fear and my focus is shattered, a trifecta of idleness, terror, and distraction. I can no longer read books or even long format magazine articles. It will remain this way for months. I will start back with Maxim, work my way up to Esquire, and finally The New Yorker before I can engage with a novel again. Also, I can't stand to let anything end, even a simple task like washing the dishes, because I'll immediately have to face the empty minutes again. But conversely, I hate to begin anything because I'm not sure I'll be able to finish. So I flip from meaningless chore to meaningless chore, breezing in and out of websites, cleaning the house in stages, pacing, going out to the front patio to sit in the sun for two minutes, picking up Clyde's poop, turning on the television, turning it off, trying to do breathing exercises, repeating it all over again. It's a simple pleasure, really, to sit still and be at peace. The healthy take it for granted. But it's one that will know. But it's one that will ever elude the benzo sufferer. Nights are bad because I cannot sleep. At best, I get two hours and often wake up screaming, seeing phantoms levitate above me to wash against the ceiling and dissolve into squidlings of ectoplasm. I ask the neighbors, sheepishly, if they can hear me bellowing, but they cannot. It will be nine months before I take my first daytime nap, and one minute nap, an incredible victory, and two years before I get more than five hours of continuous sleep at night. Some nights, scratching noises come from inside the bedroom closet, like someone is raking his fingernails along the doors. But when I turn on the lights and slide the doors back, no one is there, and the noises stop. My brain is incredibly suggestible. If I watch an upsetting movie, it seeps into me until I inhabit whatever bad event has occurred on screen. Before she left, Casey and I watched the Russell Crowe boxing film Cinderella Man, and I almost had to leave the room. When rough punches landed and heads snapped back during the fight scenes, I could feel my own gray matter sloshing around in sympathy. With horror movies, it's even worse. Who is this scared, pathetic man? I continue to see the therapist. To her credit, she gets me out the door when no one else can. I help at the food bank where she volunteers, go to her house with Clyde, take walks around Mapleton Hill with its brick Victorians and silent tree-lined sidewalks. She's not an unkind person, but again, 
She doesn't understand benzoyl withdrawal, and neither does she try to. She doesn't listen when I say that I don't think that this is my natural state. This woman reiterates that I have the worst anxiety of anyone she's seen, that I need to stop focusing on symptoms and feeling sorry for myself, and that I need to stop letting myself have panic attacks because it will only reinforce the neurological channel along which they travel. The therapist tells me that I have what the Buddhists call wild mind, and that I need to harness my racing thoughts through meditation. She advises me not to stop my current meds, saying that the doctors must have had a good reason for prescribing. And she diagnoses that I'm OCD about my breathing, as the inability to draw a full breath has become my strongest symptom and hence an obsession. My brain is so porous, so rudderless and unkempt that I imprint her words. I start to worry that I've become permanently locked in a psychotic fear state. I fret that all my years of panic attacks, of drugging, of feathering the edge on the rocks, of too many adrenaline rushes, of harsh withdrawals from benzodiazepines, have changed my brain forever. I will always be this frightened. This notion makes me deeply suicidal. One day I call my mother threatening to kill myself, and she, upon the therapist's advice, says she's going to hang up and call the sheriff. The sheriff will, of course, take me back to the hospital, where I'll probably reinstate benzos. I hang up and beat the living shit out of the couch as Clyde sinks into his crate. Poor Clyde. He has to bear witness to these things. As I calm down, he approaches with concern written in his eyes, and I knead his neck folds and tell him that I love him until he licks my tears with dog kisses that smell of cold cuts. Clyde keeps me alive where no one else can. He was abandoned outside of Taos, New Mexico as a puppy, and I cannot revisit the same unkindness upon him. The suicide urge will continue for the next year, lessening only in fits and starts. Many mornings I will wake up, look in the mirror, and say, I promise not to kill you today, leaving myself no choice but to continue. The depression peaks, thick and oily like fresh tarmac over a mass grave. I shudder atop the bed, awash in black waves of guilt and self-hatred, grieving the destruction of my mind and body, lamenting the freedom I've lost to climb and simply be in the world. Also, I'm remembering every bad thing I've ever done, including things I hadn't realized were bad at the time. As accompaniment, my therapist's voice pops into my head, intoning archly as if accusing the villain in an old gangster film. Thief. Rapist. Murderer. I am none of these, but the voice keeps coming unbidden. Soon, my mind therapist has morphed into the chicken woman, like the character Cleopatra, limbless in her box at the end of the film Freaks. The chicken woman nests in an ornate, ornate. <clears throat> the chicken woman nests in an ornate gilded Santeria altar and says, "Huffin puffalo, bagak." She expunges vomit, ruffles her feathers, settles in on black demon eggs, and then proclaims, "Rotch, rotch, rotch." The chicken woman shuts her eyes and goes to sleep, incub incubating her eggs until the next visitation. It would be funny if it weren't so awful. The chicken woman is dense and tacky and tangible, one of a host of bizarre, intrusive, self-torturing thoughts that will plague me for months. The thoughts grow, s the thoughts grow synchronously worse with other withdrawal symptoms, panic, depression, sweats, muscle rigidity, tremors, offering proof that they are external and hence not to be trusted. The fits of self-recrimination are worse after 2 p.m., they crucify me to the bed as the sun hooks toward Boulder Canyon and afternoon shadows spread across the snow-like ink blots. I lie, corpse flat, atop the comforter, mulling over every rotten thing I've done, sounds and images resurfacing in strobe-lit snippets and, endless, and endlessly looping mini-films. I'm stuck with crystalline recall, reliving the myriad shabberies committed under the benzo's disinhibiting sway. I remember every unkind expletive during a fight with a girlfriend, every arrogant fit at the cliffs, every pill I stole from the medicine cabinets of friends and family. I remember every scathing or self-congratulatory magazine article I wrote, fueled by my own bottomless insecurity and metastasized ego. And I think of the selfish, near sociopathic things I did that went far beyond these minor sins, like the time I deliberately free soloed in front of a girlfriend, Haven, outside Socorro, New Mexico, despite her strong misgivings. Haven turned from the cliff and walked down to the dry, cobbled arroyo floor of Box Canyon in bright December sun, sobbing, shoulders heaving while I tightened my shoelaces and set off up a 
11, I hadn't climbed in a decade. You should never solo with a bad head, and you should never solo if it's making someone else uncomfortable. Haven, a talented writer and editor with black hair and ice blue eyes, wanted marriage and children, but I'd been too immature to even move in together. Climbing, drugging, and screwing around took precedence at the time. I was 30, refusing to grow up. Haven loved me, and here I was willing to die on a 50-foot rock climb just to prove a point, that it was my life to throw away. 25 feet off the ground on the box's slick and destite, I nearly slipped off, my right hand flossing into a teardrop-shaped hole just as my butt pulled me backward. My sequence bullocks because I'd climbed into the crux with hatred and with haste. I'd been putting friends and family through things like this forever because it was my life to throw away. On starvation, on rocks, on risk, on drugs, on Xbox. God forbid I ever stop to consider how much I've been torturing everyone around me. I can't stand myself another second. The breathing difficulties worsen. I writhe on the bed, writhe on the couch, try to distract myself with a few TV shows I can tolerate. I'm suffocating, buried alive under a mountain of iniquity. The wind howls, the screen doors bang, the windows flex, the lights flicker, and I can never get enough air. Half hypoxic, I start going on hands and knees up the staircase from Clyde's yard when I need the, to fetch the dog inside. Then I start to fixate on not only my own breathing, but also that of other people. Watching TV, I study how the actors and news anchors draw a breath before each sentence. The air rushing into their lungs makes a ragged gasping sound I've never noticed, but now cannot unhear. It's like when someone draws your attention to your blinking. Having noted this simple, repetitive, animative process, you can no longer avoid the fact of your being alive and all of its implied existential mass, or the fact of its antithesis, non-being. At heart, a death obsession, this breathing focus will creep into interpersonal interactions, spiraling me down into a surreal thought loop in which I feel both pity and horror for all mankind, all of us but one breath from oblivion. I start to have dreams in which I'm breathing normally and autonomously, in which I walk across the room to do something as mundane as turning on a light switch without hyperventilating. Pure heaven. I'm incognitive, but also sensory overload. I hear buzzing, banjo music, and Native American chanting nearby, always one room away, a sound I cannot quite place. And my sense of smell has become hyper-acute. Our wooden kitchen table smells like a burning lumber yard, and all dairy products outgas a sour, spoiled yogurt rancidity. When I run out of food, I realize that it's incumbent upon me to go shopping, but I can't handle the supermarket. I start by going to a subway down the block, then order carryout at a Mexican restaurant, then try a 7-Eleven for sundries. Then venture into a pricey local health food market, places where transactions take place quickly and with easy egress. It takes all my strength to stand at the register and face a cashier to pretend that I'm not speaking through a plexiglass wall of benzo insanity. Eventually, I work up the nerve to go to Safeway and even to drive as far as Denver International Airport, 45 minutes away, to pick up my father. I start chewing gum so that the nervous energy has an outlet, so that some part of me, my jaw, is always in motion. This is how it will go, reclaiming quotidian things step by a hard-won step. It is like being avalanched under. If I cannot claw my way to the surface, carving my life scoop by scoop from the snow, then I will die. I try climbing twice, with dismal results. My, muscle, my muscles are weak, non-compliant, and watery. I shuffle up to Sanitas after Christmas, but can't do more than a few moves at a time before trembling, dizziness, a cast iron heaviness in my limbs, numbness in my appendages, and disorientation send me back to earth. There is a shaking at my core that spreads into my fingers and makes it impossible to command them. The sun blinds me, the light like ice picks in my eyes. On New Year's Day, I venture up to Flagstaff Mountain with friends, but I'm hyperventilating, hyperventilating so badly that even being one foot off the ground on mellow slabs is too much simulation. I can feel the planet turning beneath me, the ground collapsing into itself. The rocks and ponderosa pines rush up in frames, flashes, and a wicked spray of January sun. We end up at the Monkey Traverse, a long red sunny wall high over the green crease of Gregory Canyon. It is a 5.11 climb, 50 feet sideways, and I fake my way across on muscle memory, having done it hundreds of times, my body automatically recalling the sequences. 
but the exertion, the increase in heart rate, leaves me feeling lightheaded and funny, like I've gone for a run immediately after finishing a rich meal. I sit on a rock to remove my climbing shoes, but end up hovering instead. My body automatically poised for flight, but to where? Whatever this is, it just goes on and on and on. It has been a month since I stopped benzos, and I've only gotten sicker. I've cleared out the neurotin, but, ever, but even washing those pills out, I shouldn't feel this way. I just want someone to talk to, to bounce ideas off of. But who at this juncture? Which therapist, which doctor, which hospital will concede that the problem might be iatrogenic, that it might not be intrinsic to me, will not imply that unless I stay on the meds, I will feel this way forever? Which of them has confessed, Okay, Matt, you might be right. This is looking far more complex than just depression and anxiety, and maybe we should take a step back, stop yanking you on and off ten different pills every other week, and reevaluate underlying benzo withdrawal. Which of them has said, Some of the things you're describing are so bizarre and random that perhaps it is the medicine? I see it now. Whatever it was that the doctors told me about withdrawal lasting two weeks, it was wrong. I've been fed a lie. I wanted them to be right because I wanted my life back, and the sooner the better. But I should have guessed from what I'd read on the internet that it's not so easy. I should have better recalled the summer of 1996 and how symptoms like depression and fatigue and insomnia lingered for months. I'm desperate to confirm my theory, to finally find a concrete why, a piece of driftwood to cling to amidst the maelstrom. An email to my friend Jim shows my mindset and my dilemma. Hey Jim, sorry I didn't get back with you sooner. I had a pretty gnarly stretch there as I decided to wean myself off the quote-unquote good medicine they used to get me off the quote-unquote bad medicine. I got tired of swallowing horse pills and being dizzy. I can be dizzy on my own just with anxiety, so to hell with it. My hands were shaking too bad to really type for a few days. I don't remember that at all. My hand shaking so badly I couldn't type? Other than a few sympathetic friends, I have no one to talk to. My parents are burned out, tired of hearing about pills and benzos and anxiety madness, and I can't say I blame them. They're weary of me calling up to sob into the phone, threatening suicide, pleading that I'm choking again or cannot breathe, kvetching about how much I'm starting to abhor psychiatrists. I've leaned on them so heavily in the past year, on their love and on their finances. At one point, my mother will tell me I need to stop calling and instead reach out to my support network, as if she's no longer a part of it. But the support network, the doctors, therapists, hospitals, and my own, and my parents' willingness to turn to these sources is what put me here. I'm stuck. It's hopeless, hopeless, hopeless. I will linger on for months and years in this hell until I finally work up the courage to kill myself. I see no other way out. Then I remember that phone number in my wallet for the Benzo support group. It's at least worth a try. The call will be my final lifeline. I pick my cell phone up off the kitchen table and dial. Hello? Hi. I, well, I, okay, my name is Matt. I, um, well, and I found a number for a benzo support group on the wall at the Boulder Hospital, and I'm hoping I, did I call the right number? Yes, yes. Hi, Matt. Hi. You called the right number. My name is Allison, and I used to run the group. That was my flyer up on the wall at Boulder Community, right? Yes, it, it was. I was, wait, used to? Yes, uh, unfortunately, we don't get together anymore, but I'm still involved with the Benzo community. I left that flyer there a couple of years ago. I'm surprised it's still up. Are you here in Boulder? I am, yes. Do you think you could help me? I'd sure like to try. Maybe you should tell me a little more about what's going on, and then we can get together in person. Allison's voice has some East Coast twang, but also a calming softness of tone. This is the first phone call in weeks during which I've not felt like hanging up and bolting. It has been difficult to stay on the phone with anyone or even to be in the same space with people. When Casey's friends come over to watch Grey's Anatomy or my father came to visit, I got a panicky, trapped in an elevator feeling in my own living room. Allison tells me that she used to be on benzos herself if I'm worried about confiding in her. She pauses and then tells me that she's not a doctor or a psychologist, but is earning a master's in therapy to help counsel people through benzo withdrawal. I feel that I can trust her. 
I tell Allison my story, blurting it out in chunks and diagnoses and hospitalizations and milligram counts, listing symptoms I've been experiencing and trying to describe the stark, omnipresent fear. Allison says little more than okay and uh uh-huh, simply letting me talk it through. Then finally, finally, for the first time in this whole horrid saga, I hear the right words, the ones I've been waiting so long to hear. Matt, you might not want to hear this right now, because I know you're in hell, but you've pretty much undergone a cold turkey withdrawal, Allison says. They took you off Ativan very, very quickly, and it's going to cause a lot of symptoms. Strong, scary symptoms like what you're feeling now. It's like she's waved a magic wand over me. I pause, letting this sink in. But I thought I... That is, they said it was a safe taper, and it took me months to get here. Yes, but you started from a high dose after years of use, which is the main thing to consider, unfortunately. Four milligrams a day of clonopin is nothing to sneeze at. It's your starting point that really matters, because that's what your brain has to adjust from. I see. I guess that makes sense. The idea scares the shit out of me, but it uh, makes sense. Does this mean I'll feel this way for a long time? I ask. It's hard to say for sure. On my last time of drawing, I came off seven milligrams of clonopin. Seven milligrams? But how did you... I mean, how... I can tell you more when we meet up. For now, just know that as scary as what you're feeling is, it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you or that it's permanent, because it's not. This is far from abnormal. In fact, I'd be surprised if you weren't feeling this way. It's not abnormal? No, not at all. Not if you're taking off benzo so quickly. I know exactly what you're going through. It's terrible, worse than anything. But it's not abnormal by any means. So when... I mean, but when should I feel better? The doctor said it should only take a few weeks, but I'm sicker than before. I mean, Allison, I feel totally crazy. It's early days for you yet, Matt. I hate to say it, but again, given your history and how quickly you came off, it could be a while. You're going to have to give yourself time. Your best ally right now is going to be time. My gut drops another notch. A while. There are no hard and fast numbers. Some say a range of 6 to 18 months, but it's all totally individual. You could also reinstate and try to taper again more slowly, but I'm not sure you'd want to at this point. It sounds like you've worked pretty hard just to get off. I see. And will I feel better every day, or better all at once, or what will it look like? Well, from what I've seen, healing from benzo withdrawal is pretty erratic and individual. You might get a good few hours or a good day of feeling totally normal, what's known as a window. But then the symptoms can come back stronger than ever, and you'll just have to hang on to how you felt during that window and know that another one will come again soon. They'll keep coming and keep getting longer and closer together until eventually you feel like yourself again. I haven't had any of these windows. I wouldn't worry about that yet, Matt. I really wouldn't. It might stay that way for weeks or even months, but I do promise you this. You're going to get better. You won't feel this fear for the rest of your life. No way. Don't let anyone tell you that. It's this strong now because you're in the first three months of benzodiazepine withdrawal. It is a real, physical, and emotional syndrome from from which you will heal. I promise. If you let time run its course, your body will find its way back to what I like to call intrinsic health. Your inner sense of wellness and wholeness. It will... Yes, it will. You will. I've been exactly where you are today. I was there only four years ago, actually, and now I'm almost totally better. You just have to hang on. My God, I thank you, Allison. That is the one thing that no one has told me yet, that I will have my life back again if I just hang on. I'm standing in my living room crying, trying not to let my snuffling carry across the line. Even spinning with dizziness and sheathed in muscular rigidity, even tormented by terror and insomnia, I feel relief for the first time in years. Years. I have my answer. The pills were and are causing this. It's exactly as I've suspected all along. Allison and I agree to meet at a coffee shop in a few days. I can hardly wait. And then it happens. That night, I get a window, a temporary reprieve. I'm out on the living room floor at 2 a.m. doing bottle exercises when the movie South Park, Bigger, Longer, and Uncut, 
comes on Comedy Central. Because it's so late, the film is uncensored, and I soon find myself wheeze chuckling, then wheeze laughing, then outright belly laughing at the ribald jokes. I have not been able to properly laugh in months, but something about the movie and the bottle unfreezes my rigid belly, and it no longer feels like my diaphragm has been dipped in concrete and rammed up my throat. There has been an electrical current cur coursing all along my spine. A friend passing her hand over my belly the next year will sense it without any prodding from me and that too recedes into the black background. I can breathe freely, easily, I can laugh. The room takes on its normal contours, the walls lean back and resume an upright stance. The reading lamp in the corner no longer looks like an exploding sun. Even the Chinook winds have calmed and the cold air outside the picture window is clear and still. A crescent moon arcs through the sky, dipping west over the first flat iron. After South Park ends, I fall asleep on the couch. I wake up back in hell, but it scarcely matters because I've seen the other side. Soon windows come every day between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m., and I start sobbing, laughing plus... And I start slobbing, laughing plus sobbing, with relief when they arrive. One comes at a bank ATM on Canyon Boulevard, downtown. I deposit a check and stand there slobbing onto the keypad before I realize other people might see me. A few days later, I have a med check-in with Dr. Porridge, my second since Hopkins. I drag myself to his office, this cursed and familiar place. I do not want to see him again. I'm not really sure what I'm doing here, other than I must rely on him to prescribe nortriptyline. I sit in the lobby, chewing on a sesame bagel. Ever since Hopkins, I've had a bothersome lump in my throat on which food seems to stick, creating scary sensations of choking. A doctor there told me it was psychosomatic, a globus hystericus, the throat walls swelling due to overbreathing. But even knowing this isn't enough, and as I take small bites of bagel, I feel the lump grow and start to obsess over it. My mouth is dry, and the bagel has only butter for lubrication. It's clumping up like breadcrumbs. I need some water. Just then, the doctor comes to fetch me. I follow him to his office, casting about for a drinking fountain in the hall but not seeing one. I sit down in a big chair, and before we start, I ask Dr. Porridge for a drink. I'm freaking out without something to wash this bagel down. I'm like choking or having a panic attack, I squeak. My heart slams unchecked and wild. My throat feels like it's closing up. This is the first time I've panicked in this man's office, ever. Dr. Porridge leaves the room, fetches a cup of water, and returns. I drink, and feeling the water go unobstructed down my throat calms me enough to tough out the remainder of the appointment. I just need him to sign off on prescribing more antidepressants, and I can get the hell out of there. Sorry, Dr. Porridge. I, I just had a panic attack. Well, Matt, Dr. Porridge jokes. I'd, I'd like to think I don't have that effect on people. Oh, no, I... It's not you, Dr. Porridge. I just feel like I was choking and started freaking out a lot, a little, I stammer. I've been on the edge, as you know, ever since I came back from Baltimore, and any little thing sets me off. I, I just have no buffer. Well, that's not good, Matt. No, I suppose it isn't, but I, I know we've talked about this, but I'm really starting to be certain that this is all benzo withdrawal. I talked to a woman a few days ago who's been through this, and she said it can take months, not just weeks, to feel better. Dr. Porridge pauses, writes something on his pad. Now, Matt, you know that's not possible. I've told you, and the doctors at Hopkins have told you, that it should only be two to four weeks. Well, it's been a month now, and you certainly don't seem to be feeling any better. In fact, you seem much worse, which is very alarming to me. I'd like you to stop obsessing over this benzo thing, and instead focus on your treatment. We need to move you past this anxiety. And how would we do that, I ask. I'm tired of taking pills. Well, Matt, are you taking any of your medicines, the ones they prescribed at Johns Hopkins? Yes and no. Like I told you last time, I've stopped two of them. I'm not taking Neurotin anymore, Dr. Porridge, and that's pretty much that. I'm not going to start again. It's expensive, and I don't have the money, and I didn't like lithium either. It made me feel terrible, dizzy and terrible, so I stopped. Now, Matt, Neurotin is a perfectly safe anxiety drug, and I think we were seeing some good mood stability with the lithium. It's a good first-line treatment for the sort of emotional lability we've been seeing with you. I'm still not sure why you would want to give up your treatment now, of all times. Emotional lability. I'm, la I'm liable only because of the benzo roller coaster, because of all the other crazy pills. 
It doesn't matter, Dr. Porridge. I didn't like taking them, and, and I'm not sorry, and I'm starting to feel the same way about this antidepressant, nor tryptoline, which is quite a good one, Matt. The doctors back east were right to put you on it. It's an old antidepressant and has been very well studied. Well, I'm not sure I like it either, I say. It dries my mouth out and makes me super dizzy when I stand up, and I think it's giving me heart palpitations. I see. He jots more notes. Then, you know, now's absolutely not the time to stop, and again I'm dismayed, to be honest, that you've taken yourself off the neurotin. We need to treat your anxiety, Matt. It's seizure medicine. I don't have seizures, but it was helping your anxiety. Was it? I'm not so sure of that anymore, Dr. Porridge. I think it was mainly helping me with the symptoms of benzo withdrawal. Uh, hmm. Matt, I'm just going to say it again. There is no benzo withdrawal going on here. What you're experiencing right now is a flare-up of your original panic disorder, and it's very dangerous for it to not be medicated. I'm worried, Matt. Frankly, I'm very worried for you. I see, Dr. Porridge, I say. So am I. Because this is only a 15-minute checkup, our time has ended. I say goodbye to Dr. Porridge, the last time I will see him professionally. I go to the bathroom, splash water over my face, and look at myself in the mirror. A fierceness burns in my eyes, some flicker of the old me. The way the doctor phrased a few things has triggered a connection in my mind. Your medicines, your anxiety, your panic disorder as if they were a part of me, as if they were appendages or facial features, as if no matter how fast I run, they will always keep pace, nipping at my heels. I never really picked up on that before, on the, intono on the intonation and its connotations, because they're not really my medicines, nor my anxiety, nor my panic disorder anymore, are they? The wrong living, the starvation, the drugging, the addictive, obsessive tendencies, the pillhead mindset, that fueled the fire, have ended. So why is it still my panic disorder? Why do I still need my medicines? I don't. I absolutely do not. It might be panic attacks that I'm experiencing now, but they don't belong to anybody in particular, especially not to me. They arise from an ocean of disembodied chemical terror, as ephemeral as sea spouts that twist above the waves, only to vanish. As I've always sensed with anxiety, what I'm feeling comes from without myself that external, spectral presence, and my chat with Allison Kelliger has finally proven correct the notion that benzos are the root cause. The fear needn't belong to me now or ever again. There is a wonderful essay online called Decolonizing Our Minds, Freeing Our Spirits by the survivor of psychiatry, Leah Harris, that warns against letting psychiatrists so that warns against letting psychiatric lexicon consign you to a life sentence as a patient. Harris speaks to the power of thought and language to determine the course of our individual and collective existence, then points out how dangerous it is to let psychiatric labels like sick, disordered, and mental patient alter that course. These labels shut down understanding, she writes. They reduce the mystery and complexity of our experiences into a diagnostic category that impedes healing. These terms colonize us and foster dependency on a system to fix us. Indeed, my panic disorder, I have let them colonize my mind. I have let them call me depressed and bipolar and anxious and cyclothymic and drug addicted and panic disordered, but I have never requested that they simply call me Matt. My birth name, Matthew Salmon. That's who I am. Matthew Salmon. A climber, a writer, a son, a guardian to my dog, a friend, an intact human being. Not patient number 03942711, as my Johns Hopkins hospital ID card identified me. Not a troubled young man with a history of anxiety, substance abuse, mood cycling tendencies, and a chronic panic disorder. As they say in the Mafia movies, forget about it. Something in me releases, and a decision has been made. I'm done with psychiatry forever. I will not continue down this dead-end road another second, spiraling down into ever more serious diagnoses, serial hospitalizations, med roulette, and polydrug cocktails. I'd stay on this anti I'll stay on this antidepressant until I feel strong enough to taper, but then I will find a general practitioner outside the system to help, because I am done with psychiatry forever. I need to find the real me again, the one without chemicals, no matter what may come. I will not set foot in Dr. Porridge's office again. 
I will not take his free samples. I will not share with him the details of my life. I've bumped into Dr. Porridge in town a few times since, but it's easiest, I've learned, if we pretend not to know each other. Merely seeing his face uncorks a host of bad emotions. And besides, what really is left to say? I'm not going to change his mind about anything. I last saw him three years ago at the mall as I was leaving a massage appointment. I came out to the parking lot and hopped on my motor scooter, parked up on a sidewalk island. I keyed the ignition, revved the engine, and got ready to bounce down into the lot when, lo and behold, who should be walking toward me, latte in hand? I had my helmet on, Darth Vader black to match the scooter, eyes obscured behind wraparound sunglasses. Dr. Porridge didn't appear to recognize me, but I certainly knew who he was. I had him in my sights, there on the sidewalk, ambling along. I revved the engine, thought about it, looked past my front tire at him, revved the engine again, thought about it some more, then with the briefest ping of regret cranked the wheel hard left and bounced over the curb just as he scattered to the other side, nearly spilling his latte. The sorry bugger. He almost spilled his drink. Think of how tragic that would, have to, that would be to have to start over again, to have to go buy another coffee. For the first time in a long time, I don't have to explain myself. The woman sitting across from me knows exactly how I feel. I've met Allison Kelliger at the Amante Coffee Shop, a European-style, cyclist-friendly cafe with tiny granite tables and a new mixed-use building along Broadway in far north Boulder. It's afternoon, bright and empty inside, a rerun of last year's Tour de France playing on a flat screen in the corner. I drink steamed milk while Allison sips chai. The sun is streaming in, keen light bouncing off dirty snow heaped on the sidewalks. I'm still locked in hell, but at least for this hour, I needn't explain its specific contours. You know, they thought I was bipolar at one point, too, Allison is saying. My moods were all over the place after I stopped Benzo's. Let's see, the fourth time? Fifth? I kept bouncing around, high, low, high, low, and so they put me on mood stabilizers, but I didn't take them for very long. Yeah, I can see why, I say. I'm all over the place, too, most days. It's true, I'll be almost manic, rushing around in a frenzy, then feel fatigued and depressed, then flatline at neutral, all in the space of an hour. Eventually, Allison continues, her moods got better, more predictable and consistent. Allison is 51, pretty, petite, with a lean build of the cycling champion that she is, her blonde hair piled high above bangle earrings. She lands somewhere between boulder athlete and new age hippie, but not in the flaky, airy, spacey way. This woman is sharp. At present, she is completing her master's in counseling from the Naropa Institute, a private Buddhist university in town. Allison is four years, years out from taking benzos, no longer taking any meds, and has been winning her age category in cycling and cross-country skiing events. She feels, she tells me, healthy, strong, and normal, like the Allison before benzos. She'd first started taking the pills in 1986, but... But before then, she'd been a competitive road biker for six years, named to the national cycling team for 1983 and 84, and earned a bronze medal in the national championships in 1984 in New Hampshire. At her peak, Allison rode two to three hours a day, six days a week, before retiring from competition to design cycling clothing. Like me, she even had equipment sponsors. Allison's story is much like my own. It's so much like my own, it's uncanny. Perhaps because of pushing so hard athletically, or perhaps because of her high-pressure job, she began to have panic attacks in the mid-1980s, around the same time she retired from competition. A doctor, the same doctor she would see all along, prescribed Xanax, and Allison's usage became a daily fact of life in 1986, even as she soon began waking up in absolute terror and having to take her first dose immediately to beat back the fear. By the time she'd shed benzos, 17 years later, she was taking 7 milligrams of clonopin a day, all prescribed by the same physician. Allison did her final withdrawal at detox in just weeks. Like me, in my bleary tolerance withdrawal years, Allison came to dwell in a weird twilight existence, fading away with a whisper, a shadow person who disappeared, who disappeared from her friends and even quit riding her bicycle in 1991. As she will tell me later, I wasn't interested in anything, really. I lost interest in my career. That part of myself was just missing, that part of myself that really wanted to even do much of anything. Allison was a shell, functioning at the bare minimum, taking the benzo solely to stave off withdrawal. 
She wanted to quit, but was perpetually unable. Allison tried four times before it stuck, each time reinstating at the four-month mark because the symptoms were so extreme. And because nobody told her what to expect, as she is telling me right now. So, you said you're having some pretty weird symptoms, right? Allison asks. Yes, you could definitely say that. Nutty stuff. Crazy stuff, like a bad acid trip. Only this one doesn't stop. Everything is disordered, like a kind of waking nightmare, or... Her eyes light up. Yes, exactly. You just described it so perfectly. It is like a bad acid trip, which I know about, unfortunately. She laughs, then says, I remember that. Everything is distorted and scary and coming at you so quickly. Nothing looks like itself or sounds like itself. Even your face in the mirror or the sound of your own voice. How horrible that was. You poor, poor man. Yes, like that, I say, like way overstimulating, and I can smell everything way too much, and I keep hearing sounds and like, well, like music one room over, but there's never anything there, music and dim kind of voices. It's scaring the shit out of me, Allison. Some of these symptoms are almost supernatural or something. It's been positively demonic. Oh, I know what that is, she says. That's actually no big deal. I used to call that hell music. Hell music? It sounds like the music you'd hear in hell. Yes, precisely, I say. Are there any things around your house that make constant noise, like a TV or water pipes or a refrigerator? For me, the hell music went on for months, Allison said, until I found the source. It did? I asked. Yeah, I'd hear it every morning when I was home alone. And it scared me senseless until I realized it was just sprinklers in the park behind her house. Sprinklers. Oh, wow, you know something, Allison? We live in this old rental, and the refrigerator buzzes and vibrates like crazy when it kicks on. Aha! It must be, then, that I hear the music. Holy shit, it's all right there in front of me. Hell music. My brain is hearing the refrigerator and turning it into something else. I guess I'm not going crazy after all. No, you're absolutely not. We talk symptoms for another hour, and Allison says that she's felt every last thing I'm describing. Each time I hear a confirmation, I relax a little more. In Allison's opinion, I'm very strong to have come this far. She says that many people in my situation simply give up and go back on the pills, and adds that if she were me, she'd consider staying the course because reinstating probably won't help at this juncture. I'm too far along into the cold turkey. The damage has been done. Finally, I ask, when will I get better? Well... My sense is that if you can get through these first few months, you'll start to notice milestones, with certain symptoms dropping away at three months, then six months, then more at a year, then feeling pretty good at a year and a half. Most of the benzo people I've talked to recall noticeable milestones of wellness around these markers. Eighteen months is a pretty standard time frame for healing. Eighteen months. It sounds like an eternity, but then Allison reminds me that I won't feel this particular way the entire time. Each month will elevate the floor such that the very worst days one year from now will be better than the best days at present. She says that I might not be symptom-free in a year or even 18 months, but that I might feel well enough to, longer, to no longer be symptom-focused. I also ask Allison what she knows about protracted withdrawal. Allison again urges me not to worry too much about labels or time frames, but to just believe that I will get better given time. Time. It's every recovering Benzo head's worst enemy, but also his primary ally. Never have I seen time, which I wanted to fly by, instead creep by so slowly, to protract, as it were. In her paper, Protracted Withdrawal from Benzodiazepines, the Post-Withdrawal Syndrome, Dr. Heather Ashton defines protracted withdrawal in medical terms. It is, she writes, a post-withdrawal syndrome which may linger for months or even years, and affects 10-15% to 15 of chronic Benzo users. Dr. Ashton suggests two possible root causes, the slow reversal of receptor changes in the brain and the exposure of poor stress coping abilities and other personal difficulties previously masked by benzos. In other words, if you never learn to control panic attacks without benzos, a bad withdrawal will only highlight that shortcoming. Going off cold turkey can also put you at greater risk for protracted withdrawal by essentially shocking down-regulated GABA receptor sites. 
However, there's so much variance in individual tolerance and history, some fortunate souls do seem to come off quickly or without trouble, that it's often difficult to pinpoint where a long, painful, but normal withdrawal ends and a protracted one begins. In other words, there's no clear, objective measure of the point at which withdrawal becomes protracted. For myself, seven years out with recurrent but background difficulties breathing, I certainly qualify as protracted, though I no longer have panic anxiety. In any case, I don't think of myself as still in withdrawal, having resumed 90% of my normal activities. On the purely pharmacological level, the acute withdrawal syndrome, writes Ashton, is classically described as lasting 5 to 28 days with a peak in severity around two weeks post-withdrawal. The two weeks of flu-like symptoms and slightly elevated anxiety that the Hopkins doctors warned about. But Ashton argues that even this time period has probably been underestimated, as most clinical studies end after one or two months, after which ongoing symptoms are no longer monitored. And these studies can fail to account for dropouts who often leave to resume taking benzodiazepines, possibly because of strong symptoms. Indeed, writes Ashton, persist persistence of high anxiety levels beyond 28 days post-withdrawal is usually interpreted not as a withdrawal effect, but as a reemergence of an underlying anxiety state previously controlled by the benzodiazepine. Voila, what happened to me? In America, this bit of misinformation, the so-called underlying panic disorder, Dr. Porge cited even as I was in the throes of acute withdrawal, is the most commonly accepted version of the truth and is certainly responsible for keeping untold thousands in the benzo trap. Patients are told that it's them, not the chemicals, and they lose all hope. They go back on the pills and keep chasing diagnoses, or they succumb to the darkness. On the Yahoo group I will join, a tale will circulate about the brother of the mo of one moderator who, taken cold turkey off Restoril, a benzo sleeping pill, at detox, and given the party line about a brief, uncomfortable post-withdrawal period, sub subsequently came home and shot himself dead. You can find plenty of horror stories like this on the web and in benzo forums about nightmare withdrawals, protracted symptoms, and even rumors of brain damage what Dr. Ashton has called equivocal evidence of cortical atrophy and neurological impairment, perhaps reversible upon cessation. But for anyone in the acute phase, I would urge that you do not dwell on such tales for four reasons. First, you don't want to imprint negativity or fearful thoughts onto your extremely delicate psyche. Second, you don't know what will happen. Everyone heals in a different way and at a different rate. Third, it is often difficult to distinguish where protracted symptoms end and a person not facing the underlying issues, depression, isolation, lack of purpose, buried trauma, or other psych med use or substance abuse, begins. And fourth, you do not want to enter withdrawal with the ID fix that this is the worst thing ever and that you will never be the same again because it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. By fearing the fear, you will only increase its influence. As Ashton will state in a phone interview with me, Withdrawal need not be a horror, even if that was my experience of it. If you go slowly, letting yourself learn, relearn, or, pour, or put in place anxiety coping mechanisms as you, your dose declines and GABA receptors upregulate, you can mitigate your fear. It also helps, Ashton has written, if the patient dictates the rate of taper, ideally on an outpatient basis within the structure of his or her life. In other words, away from hospitals and the culture of illness and with some sense of personal destiny and control. The problem, of course, in America is that there are scant few places that offer a slow, months, not weeks, supervised withdrawal on either an outpatient or an inpatient basis. The infrastructure is lacking. Sure, a detox center can get you off in days, but they might also hook you on barbiturates or anti-epileptics on your way off. Either way, they've sown further addiction and possible years of protracted symptoms. That American need for a quick fix, the same one that drives us to seek pharmaceutical crutches in the first place, can paradoxically land you in an unending maelstrom. There's all this media hype, especially in America, that benzos are terrible, that you can't go off them without going through terrible hell, Ashton will tell me. That's true for some people, but holds mainly for people in these detox centers. Ashton posits that the syndrome has been terribly hyped up by the media and those who go to the benzo groups, which by their nature attract those who have the very worst withdrawals and thus can't be seen to represent the entire population. Most people get off well and quietly, so they're not going to need to visit those groups, she'll tell me. Now, consider that benzos are most commonly prescribed for anxiety. To Ashton's mind, anxiety sufferers tend to subjectively experience the worst withdrawals because of their proclivity toward fear. 
Benzos are most efficient in their actions, especially if you're anxious to start with, she'll say. People who are anxious love them. Then people get all these messages that it's going to be hell to get off and the fear compounds. On the flip side, I have corresponded with a few people who prescribe benzodiazepines for problems like sleep disorders or muscle spasms, developed anxiety issues during withdrawal that they'd never experienced before. Allison Kelliger will later bring up her own complementary theory that while not all who taper get the withdrawal syndrome, a certain percentage might unknowingly do so but end up misdiagnosed and placed on further meds, staying in the psych med world forever, as I nearly did. Or they might reinstate because the fear and symptoms are intolerable, as Allison did. In any other case, they drop back into the psychiatric death machine, becoming statistical ciphers. As Allison will say, it's only the people who want their lives back badly enough, who love life enough that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get it back, who will see it through to wellness. To escape, you must make a conscious decision to break the fear benzo, fear benzo cycle. In my case, it took a willingness to endure terror like nothing I've ever felt, never knowing exactly when, and on bad days, if it might end. I liken it to passing the proverbial point of no return on a dangerous rock climb. A good analogy might be my scariest first ascent, Primate, the 5.13 up rainbow color flat irons rock on which the second crux become. A good analogy might be my scariest first ascent. Primate, the 5.13 up rainbow colored flat irons rock on which the second crux comes 60 feet up, protected by a sideways big bro tube chalk that might or might not prevent a fatal ground fall. The day I red pointed the climb in July 2001, I reached the big bro, slotted my knee against a flange. Let's just redo this starting at to escape. To escape, you must make a conscious decision to break the fear benzo, fear benzo cycle. In my case, it took a willingness to endure terror like nothing I've ever felt, never knowing exactly when and on bad days, if it might end. I liken it to passing the proverbial point of no return on a dangerous rock climb. A good analogy might be my scariest first ascent, primate, the 5.13 up rainbow color flat irons rock on which the second crux comes 60 feet up, protected by a sideways big bro tube chalk that might or might not prevent a fatal ground fall. The day I red pointed the climb in July 2001, I reached the big bro, slotted my knee against a flange of rock to take weight off my upper body and began to to de-pump, flicking my hands and wrists to recover my forearms. I stayed at the stance for some time, bleeding back my strength and visualizing the tiny pebbles and crimp edges above. If I made it through, I would reach relative safety, larger bucket handholds and a water groove where the protection became reliable again. As my breathing and heart rate slowed, I considered my options. I could do one of three things. One, retreat by unclipping the big bro and jumping onto a nest of cams 15 feet below, risking a leg-breaking 40-foot fall. Two, retreat by weighting the big bro and lowering off, though if it pulled at any point, I would plummet straight to the ground. Or three, place my faith in my skills and the potential reliability of the big bro and continue to the top. Two minutes later, feeling rested, refreshed, and calm, I chose the third option. It worked. I completed primate without a fall or even feeling like I would fall. That's what it's like with benzo withdrawal. To escape, you must place total faith in yourself and continue on no matter what crux presents itself. Trust me, it's worth it to have your life back, to be free of that little orange bottle. You will feel a peace and a strength like none you have ever known on the pills. There are other unseen benefits to quitting as well, namely a slim chance of relapse. As Dr. Ashton will tell me, anyone who gets off benzos stays off. It's because they have a horror of the pills and don't ever want to go back on them. She'll say that, in a way, recovering benzo addicts have it better than those recovering from alcohol, cocaine, meth, or heroin, which fry your dopamine reward center and do lasting damage to brain and body, leaving you with pangs, cravings, black depressions, and a high probability of relapse. With benzos, if used and not abused, she'll say, you don't get that awful craving. The craving you get is, if I take a pill, it would just relieve the anxiety. I will gain same this assertion. Even on my most stress-filled days now, I've not once considered taking a benzo. I find the idea abhorrent. Instead, I play with my son or go for a walk with a dog. You need to give benzo people hope and a sense of self-determinancy. So here's a final kernel. Even if someone reports protracted symptoms 5, 6, 7, or even 10 years after stopping, 
those symptoms have likely faded to background noise. At seven years out, I suffer comparatively not at all. It barely crosses my radar that this bad thing happened. I'm out of a two or three night run of poor sleep once a month, and I continue to have on again, off again trouble breathing. I haven't run or gone above 10,000 feet since 2005, as chest tightness and sports asthma makes me have to pause too often for breath. But I can get my respiratory and heart rate up in short bursts on the rock and can walk at my flat out fastest pace, even on rolling hills, for hours. I've recovered between 80 and 90% of my athletic ability, which is significant when you consider that I was so weak on one walk with my father around the grounds of Hopkins that he had to steady me, his arm about my shoulders, as I crept along the sidewalk. I think of my friend Craig, who plummeted 100 feet to the ground in a climbing accident, damaging his spinal column and eventually losing his, power, his lower right leg. Craig on sites 5.12 and has climbed El Capitan, 3,000 feet of rock in a day, despite ongoing neurological pain and not having a feeling foot. But when Craig and I climb together, neither of us complains about what doesn't work. At a certain point after any trauma, the best gift you can give yourself is to simply live. This dissolves any new boundaries, any perceived narrowing of your world. As the daylight fades at Amante, Allison also asks me about structure in my life, and I say that there has been very little. She says she took a bakery job at five months off after realizing that distraction was the only thing that helped pass the time. Just being in the bakery each morning, preparing muffins, a partially physical, partially mental task, gave backbone to her days, especially the mornings, her worst time. I've likewise been able, I've likewise been waking up backlogged with sleep chemicals, jolting to in cold despair. Oh hell, not this again. When the alarm goes off and Casey starts dressing for work. Casey and I are still living as roommates, despite having broken up. I tell Allison I can probably take on light editing jobs, and that the following week I am slated to start helping a buddy on a construction site. She tells me that these both sound like good developments. Then Allison offers a final piece of advice that I check out at a benzo support group on Yahoo. <clears throat> that I check out a benzo support group on Yahoo, where she is a moderator, since her local group isn't meeting in person anymore. She gives me the URL and asks also that I stay in touch. Of course I will, I say. She's the only person I've met who's talked to any sense. I join the Yahoo group that night and see that it has 13,000 members. Many posts are from people more desperate than myself, terrified missives in all caps without spacing or punctuation. Oh my god, oh my god, I'm so glad I found this group. My doctor took me off Xanax in a week and I'm freaking out and dying and my husband is threatening to leave me and I can't sleep and having panic attacks all the time. So many tales would break even the hardest of hearts of people losing jobs, homes, families, and spouses because they're so weak, housebound, and compromised. Like my own, many stories involve red herring bipolar diagnoses and polydrugging with cocktails of psychiatric medicines. The moderators, all veterans, years out from withdrawal, offer solace, tapering advice, links to Dr. Ashton's manual and other benzo sites, and snippets of their own experience to validate those of the newbies. My first post asks about agoraphobia, saying that it's a problem I kicked years ago that has come back with a vengeance. Rick, the man at BenzoLiberty.com, who handcuffed himself to his bed to keep from committing suicide, responds that, yes, this and hundreds of other scary symptoms are par for the course, but they do improve over time. It is pretty much only through peer groups and forums like this that people looking to kick psychiatric meds will find meaningful support, while they will learn what to expect and how long the process can take. Time is the one thing I do have, and I use the next year to research benzos, psychotropic meds, and psychiatric illness. I stay in Boulder until February, working home construction and taking on copy editing jobs. It can be unsettling at the job site, my balance off, fatigue thick and impenetrable, trying not to fall into the ditches and open wells full of nails and rebar and concrete and lumber. One day I have to walk a joist out along the home's highest wall, and the exposure, 20 feet on either side, is intimidating in the way it was my first day rope climbed. I can feel the fierceness, the finality, the clangorousness of the void, but being out in the sun and the wind, distracted and in motion, helps even if I struggle with the more strenuous tasks like carrying heavy tools or sledgehammering old walls. I'm working with a good buddy, Mike, and a few other low-key guys, and nobody asks any questions. Nobody judges me for my alternating bouts of agitation and silence. That February, I returned to Carbondale to work at climbing. 
I have mixed feelings about returning to this mountain town and did a desk job, but the structure, salary, and getting back on health insurance seem important. I remember my first day back, obsessing over whether or not I'd have to crawl up the building's six front stairs and how humiliating that would be at a magazine called Climbing. But I make it, leaning heavily on the railing, and I soldier through that day and the others that follow. I want nothing more than to cut and run, but I get up and go to work because this is what people do. Also, I can bring Clyde to the office. Having him curled up next to my desk and to walk with at lunch anchors me in some necessary way. We enroll in an obedience class, me and this crazy, bounding plot hound. As spring falls the world, I feel well enough to attend yoga classes and even climb a little. Once a week on a local gym wall or on a rock if the hike is short. It is a momentous occasion the first time I make it sideways, a 50-move traverse across the entire gym wall. At night, I come home and work on a website I've created mainly for myself to document various symptoms. I have to be always doing something or the terror floods back in. It's a wiki-style hyperlinked encyclopedia that includes more than 60 oddities, from a swollen stress belly to painful acne volcanoes to tremors to myoclonic jerks to insomnia to TMJ jaw pain to teeth chattering to teeth itching, a painful tingling in the dental nerves, to intrusive thoughts to depression to apathy to hot and cold flashes to the flophouse sweats to panic attacks to nightmares to balloons of pressure swelling in my head and chest, to nosebleeds and bloody sputum, to bouts of low blood sugar, to fatigue, to my hair falling out and turning white, to bladder spasms, to poor focus, to trouble breathing, to costochondritis, to uncontrollable blushing, to an electric current along my belly and spine, to a metallic taste in my mouth, to parathesia, and countless other symptoms. Benzo withdrawal is both chimera and chameleon, GABA, after all, is the most prevalent inhibitory neurotransmitter, found not only in the brain and the central nervous system, but with receptors in many organs, including the lungs. So it follows that a GABA system gone haywire will cause not only psychological but physical problems as well. In many cases, these can present as diseases from multiple sclerosis to irritable bowel syndrome to asthma that resolve once withdrawal has ended. As Allison Kelliger will phrase it, Benzo withdrawal mimics all anxiety disorders, it mimics depression, it mimics anything you'd seen in a person way out of balance, including bipolar disorder, agoraphobia, social phobia, because people just don't want to go out, MS, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, restless leg syndrome, and hypochondria. The Yahoo moderators also caution about seeking doctors during withdrawal, because you might be saddled with diagnosis and treatment for a condition you don't really have. At one point, I'll see a physician for an asthma stress test, and he will find that I have the condition. Though I still carry the inhaler he prescribed, I've used it only twice in six years. Perhaps it's not healthy to focus on symptoms this way, but I figure that by documenting just how outlandish they are and how they are not part of my normal existence, I can paint an objective picture of my subjective health. Just as Allison predicted, I improve every month. My muscles feel tauter, I have fewer panic attacks, I sleep more, I can breathe more smoothly, the intrusive thoughts recede, and the world looks more like itself again. I build my physical strength back up by walking Clyde around the golf course neighborhood where I'm renting a room from friends, looping broad, quiet, freshly paved streets beneath Mount Sopris, going a little farther every time, adding in small hills. I continue lifting weights. I take Clyde to the dog park every day and let him go bonkers since I'm unable to run him myself. When summer comes, I head back to the rocks with friends. We found a virgin sandstone fin in the scrub oak canyon west of Carbondale and spend long days there bolting new climbs. It is tough, very tough, to carry a fully laden climbing pack the mile hike in, but being at the cliffs is a healing diversion. The smell of the pine trees, the wind whooshing over the rock, the scudding of clouds, the cool mountain air, it's like returning to the womb. Being up off the ground can be overwhelming, too stimulating somehow. My benzo belly oozes over my harness, and my fingers and toes often tingle so much I can't feel them. Yet I do manage 5.12, again, on good days. But I have to watch it. During one divine two-day window, I push hard at the cliffs and end up not sleeping for three nights. Until my parasympathetic nervous system comes fully back online, I mustn't get too keyed up. By August 2006, nine months after stopping benzos, I feel better enough to drop my final medicine, nortriptyline. I just want to rip off this last band-aid, so I approach my doctor, a general practitioner in town, and tell him my story. He knows about the dangers of benzos. He's very sympathetic and agrees to help me. 
Anecdotes on the Yahoo group will bear this out. Family doctors and practitioners are often more receptive to helping people off pills than psychiatrists. I need to make my way off 100 milligrams of antidepressant. I will cut 25 milligrams every two weeks. It should take two months. I promise to check in with the doctor if it becomes too difficult, though I know I'll do no such thing because this ends now, no matter what. It's the final undoing. This last medicine has been holding back a neurochemical tsunami, and with each cut, the benzo symptoms flare up again, a kindling effect as all hell breaks loose in my brain, which is where this book begins, with me at my darkest hour, think of, thinking of ending it because the pain has gone on for too long and I'm just too tired. I kneel on the road at rifle, a shard of broken bottle in my hands, slashing at my wrist because I don't know what else to do. Andrew drives me home. We have that lunch. I slurp PM soup. The next day, my stepfather drives out to Carbondale to fetch me, bringing me home for two weeks to recover in Albuquerque. He and my mother have a one-acre farm in the rural South Valley, so I occupy myself with yard work around their place. I lie on the couch at night, fat, bloated, and in head-to-toe muscular pain. I return to Colorado after that and again, as before, resume day-to-day -day life. For a time, certain days are so bad that I dig my fingernails into my forehead, leaving half-moon indentations in my brow to supplement the pain. But the story doesn't end there. I didn't kill myself because that would mean they won. The story ends here, with me living in Gun Barrel years later, feeling, on a good day, almost like myself. It ends with me in 2007, meeting the woman I would marry, Kristen, my best and most trusted climbing partner, the love of my life, and the mother of our son, Ivan. As soon as I'm done writing, I'll head to the rock gym and climb until I'm tired and buzzing with endorphins, come home, have dinner with Kristen and play time with Ivan, watch a horror flick without having a panic attack, read a novel or an article in the New Yorker, and then go to bed worn out and happy and sleep an honest eight hours, when Ivan lets us. I'll take all this for granted because I have my health back. I know peace again. It is a true intrinsic health that grows stronger every year, just like Alison Kelliger told me. These days, I don't define myself as a survivor of psychiatry or a benzo survivor because I don't care for such labels. On the Yahoo group, many posters would add a signature that listed which pills they'd been on, for how long, at what dose, and when their final dose of benzodiazepine was, and with which method they'd gone off, cold turkey, CT, water titration, or a slow taper. There was also an endless debate about addiction versus dependency, as many benzo folks resented being called addicts, as if it lumped them in with smack mainlining gutter trash. In any event, your body doesn't care how you got hooked. I never went in for that because I felt it defined me not by who I am, but by who I'm not. Neither do I accept that I'm depressed or anxious or always will be. These are reductive, clumsy rubrics for nuanced hues of the human soul, and inelegant and imperfect as inelegant and imprecise as using a chainsaw for a root canal. I've since realized that fixing myself is simple math. Try this experiment. Just try it. Start with a statement like, I'm depressed or I'm anxious. Now add the word because. I'm depressed because or I'm anxious because. The one caveat is you can't write in chemical imbalance. See epilogue. From here, you can do one of two things. Fix the left side of the equation by medicating your disease or fix the right side of the equation by addressing the core problem. Scary, though not impossible, especially with the guidance of an attentive partner, friend, therapist, or healer. Perhaps you're depressed because your father died or you lost a close friend. Perhaps you're anxious because you drink too much, eat poorly, and have a wicked commute through teeth-gnashing gridlock. Perhaps you hate your job and your marriage is in trouble. So you can either medicate the symptoms, which won't fix the root problem, and might indeed worsen it when you build tolerance to the meds and inherit a whole new set of iatrogenic issues. Or, you can fix the right side of the equation by making the needed life changes, albeit potentially tough ones. For me, it was, I'm anxious because I have prolonged a panic disorder caused by bulimorexia and putting tremendous pressure on myself to achieve as an athlete by becoming dependent on drugs. And... I'm depressed because these drugs have narrowed my life to the point of inanition. Inanition. Once I chose to fix those things, to get off the benzos, to quit drugging, and to eat healthier, the symptoms began to vanish and have stayed away. Also, I've come to accept that I am and always will be a dark person, what some might label a depressive, and to treat that as sacred. If on some days I can barely stand another's voice or cannot bear to be out in the world, it's because my mind, like a hibernating grizzly, seeks a cave or because the world is not worthy, is not worth being in that day. 
It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with me. The darkness is me. It makes me unique and fuels my creative fire. I cannot deny that the first three years off meds weren't filled with epic suffering, but it was a passing storm. Ask Kristen. Some days I'd sink so low that all I could do was lie prone on the couch, speechless, watching talk shows with the volume turned off. Some nights I hyperventilated so badly all I could do was place my head sideways on the pillow and hope that sleep carried me off somewhere better. Sometimes I'd have panic attacks at work or in traffic or even at the cliff, obsessing <clears throat> Sometimes I'd have panic attacks at work or in traffic or even at the cliff, obsessing over choking or over some minor fluctuation in my heartbeat, and I recognize that I remain more easily excitable, in fact, quick to anger or feel fear having been battered by withdrawal from a central nervous system depressant. I might always have a lowered excitatory threshold. As such, I'm careful about how much danger I incur on the rock and selective about what I define as acceptable risk, i.e. no more death routes, which was inevitable anyway. I'm 40 now and have a child. But I've stopped having panic attacks. That's over. I had so many during those bleak, black, benzo years that I stopped caring whether I lived or died and in doing so was freed from the fear of death that ignited the attacks in the first place. Moreover, the benzo anxiety was so profoundly horrible that garden variety life anxiety and even panic triggers like being on an airplane or work stress no longer faze me. I recognize them as temporary. I work on my breathing and I barrel on through. My victory is not complete, but it's a victory nevertheless. I might not summon another 14er, but I've hiked Bear Peak, a nearly 9,000 foot summit in the Boulder Mountains. I've taken eight-hour walks with Clyde around the local grasslands, a solitary and meditative pleasure, and I've been able to on-site 5.13 again. The turning point came in late 2008, nearly three years after stopping benzos. That autumn, my friend Ted and I completed a 5.13 first ascent, my first flat irons climb of the grade since my world blew up. The climb tackles a yellow streaked wall on broad flat iron called the slab at the mouth of fern canyon a shadowy forested crease in the southern boulder mountains you hike 45 minutes uphill to get there the wall faces north and sits deep in the ponderosa so you must take the pains to warm up before attempting the harder climbs during the cooler months until that autumn i often couldn't feel my fingers or toes on the rock even on warmer days i'd pump out or slide off my extremities numb but on this day, in mid-November, the blood flowed warmly to my fingers and toes, and even the hike in didn't feel too strenuous. Ted and I began across the canyon on a short, sunny 5.10, and then made our way to the slab. We'd come close to doing the climb earlier that week, but a blustery wind froze our digits at the crux, 40 feet up on the holds the size of matchsticks. Today was a rare 70 degree day before the snow started flying and we knew we either climbed now or waited until spring. We dropped our packs at the base, the only two climbers at the cliff, our quick draws ready, hang already hanging from the earlier attempt. I shoot up and set off, climbing through single pad edges on a red brown face up to the yellow streak, mulling over the crux sequence above. Right hand sloper, brick, left hand sloper, cup, feet high, right hand beach ball. Hold the beach ball and go again to the wrinkle. Jack the left foot way up on the slower cup. Left hand to the razor side pull. Tuck the right foot in and dead point high and right to the dragon's tooth. Yes, that was it. Do these moves with faith, precision, and authority, and you'll climb. For the moment, I focus on something other than benzo withdrawal. Now my biggest problem was overcoming 70 feet of overhanging sandstone. Ted and I both red pointed the climb that morning, nailing in on our first attempt. That afternoon, we established a difficult boulder problem along the base of the slab, loath to head back to town until we'd climbed ourselves out. Weak sun slanted low and watery through the pines. Clyde ran about wrestling sticks as fluffy, back squirrel, as fluffy black squirrel scolded him from the trees. There, the air was cool, but not too cool, and autumn was winding down. Where better to be than right here, shredding our fingertips? Finally, it was time to go. As we hiked down along the Shanahan Ridge Trail, the city spreading before us and its orange grid twinkling on, the sun dropped behind Fern Canyon. A crepuscule, a crepuscular, a crepuscular cold moved up my spine, fingers of incipient anxiety prickling the fine hairs along my neck. 
sundown, the toughest time in the withdrawal years, when I'd sit sobbing and lamenting my lost, shattered life. Hey, Ted, can you hold on a second? I asked. Sure, man, what's up? I just need to get something, I said. We stopped on the trail. A light breeze rustled through the pines as the night's black embrace spread along the eastern horizon, compressing itself along the prairie plateaus where the Great Plains wash in. I could just see the southern aspect of Seal Rock high to the northwest, a black water streak forming a runnel above Primate. I'd taken four milligrams of Ativan before leading Primate, but really, the pills had done nothing. I'd been so addicted by then that the higher dose only staved off tolerance withdrawal. It temporarily made me feel normal. The climb had been all me, my life on the line, and I'd held it together. I'd weighed my options, made a conscious choice, and then pushed through to safety. I passed Clyde's leash to Ted and set down my backpack, the same pack I'd rummaged through so many times to find my benzo bottle. As Ted and the hound watched, I unzipped the pack, reached in, and plucked out the thing I'd been looking for. It was a fleece jacket to ward off the cold. I put it on, picked up my pack, and took Clyde's leash back as he nosed impatiently at the backs of my knees. The hound hates halting mid-hike. He wants to be, always be moving, prancing down the trail, his brindled butt bopping as he picks up one scent or the next, moving forward, alive in the moment, sniffing out the next conquest. Warmer now, we descended toward Boulder, another perfect day in the flat irons behind us with countless others waiting to be born from the darkness.